Hi. I'd like to welcome you this evening as we explore the myth of Satan. This is going to be just a brief overview. It's going to go into a little bit of how we view Satan from the mythological aspect and other aspects that are similar. If you hear any noises going off in the background, I apologize. My phone's going off. But I'm not going to stop this recording just to take care of it. With that being said, let's take a little look at Satan. For the most part, what society knows about Satan comes either from our entertainment, like Hollywood and television shows, which are totally ludicrous, or from the Judaic Christian thought. And what exactly does that mean to come from the Judaic Christian thought? It means it comes from a little information, culled from very brief, very fleeting, and often ambiguous references in the Jewish scriptures, which is later embellished in the Christian writings to form a being that is in opposition to the God of those faiths. The most famous such reference is the story of the serpent, supposedly enticing Eve in Genesis 3. This act is what? The whole of Christianity and Judaism is based on. And it left the human race in a fallen state that we occupy today. We're told that Eve eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, gives them to Adam, try, who, in the text, didn't need any apparent coercing, contrary to the myth. Eve didn't even seduce Adam. In that instant, their eyes were opened and God expelled humanity from the paradise because of it. This is one way to look at the story, but never any statement that identifies that figure of the serpent as Satan. It was only in later writings that Hebrew and New Testament traditions, often post-scriptural, began to use the Hebrew term Satan or adversary as synonymous with the, the serpent. Coming through scripture, looking for the supposed maleficent force, you will find only a handful of reference. It appears in Isaiah, probably referring to the king of Babylon, fleetingly in Revelation and Genesis, a brief, although very interesting, look at the adversary in Job as well as scant references in the Gospels, which can hardly be looked at. If you were actually take all these references from Scripture that are conventionally thought as defining the Satanic, you'd come up with maybe a hundred lines. And most of these are clothed in ambiguity. Let us take a closer look at that fall of Adam and Eve. Here, Eve's supposed to have eaten from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Well, Bible scholars are not even entirely clear whether the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, both found in Genesis, are two distinct things or are one and the same. One of the earliest exponents of the one tree theory was German the uh, theologian Karl Bud, that's B-U-D-D-E, followed by Klaus Westermann. Both are traditional figures and highly recognized in their field. They present the extraordinary idea that the tree of knowledge and the tree of life were one and the same. What would this mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, what kind of life were Adam and Eve conscripted to in the so-called paradise? What kind of life were they granted if they had no knowledge of good and evil? In such a state, they didn't create or produce. Yes, it is true they didn't have friction. After all, how could they? But they ate from that tree. They were expelled from Eden and begat two sons, Cain and Abel. Differences were introduced into the world. Cain acted on anger at his brother, with whom he had deep fissures. His brother was pious and theological and favored by God. Cain was an independent a loner, a rebel, and worship of God didn't really suit him. Cain loved his brother, yet had deep differences with him because their mom and dad had eaten from the tree of good and evil. 
Cain was compelled to do something he regretted for the rest of his life. Acting in a moment of passion, he slew his brother. Yet at the same time, if the knowledge of good and evil had not been introduced into the world allegedly by an adversarial force represented by the serpent, then not only would there have been no differences between Cain and Abel, but in a very distinct sense, there would have been no Cain and Abel. Because everything and everyone would have been classified by a certain mm, sameness. What would be the purpose of creation by a god if such a thing happened in absence of distinctions of measurement or protection or counterproduction or even friction which inevitably arises by from choice what type of a world would this be it is possible to look at genesis 3 from a different perspective if you take out the idea that the story comes from a sacred text breathed into the ears of mortals by god and look at it as if it would and should be classed as a primeval, primitive, mythological work, a parable of human development. That doesn't exclude the spiritual or extra-physical, but all great spiritual works are the product of humanity seeking out its origin and purpose. If we look at scripture that way, we can detect through history a slender thread of insight. This thread is woven from the antiquity up even through our own time that reads compellingly different in perspective into our foundational Western myth. Seen from this perspective, the serpent can be seen as a great liberator and emancipator of Eve. Quite a few of the proto-feminists of the 19th century and others during the Romantic Age did in fact, as artists, rebels, political agitators, view Satan as a kind of philosophical grandfather because they saw Satan in league with certain readings in romantic, anarchist, and socialist literature, not as the enemy of humanity, but as its rough liberator. For example, romantic poets such as Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, and even earlier than that, William Blake, identified with the figure of Satan as an actual creator or co-creator of humanity. Not a biological fact, but as an intellectual fact, as a bringer of the arts and sciences, as well as the archetypical hero who rejected conformity with that which was just handed down and thought to be the norm. You will find a fascinating esoteric storyline that has a Promethean feel running through Western culture, including within the often maligned traditions of the Gnostics. But back to the Romantic poets, they offer a particularly powerful expression of this esoteric perspective. They understood that Satan was not the seducer of Eve, but a truth bringer. Because if you look at these few lines in Genesis 3 and 4, which have come to form the moral foundation of Western life, you will see that Satan actually told Eve the truth. Satan asked, what kind of God wants you to keep from your intellectual present potential? Wants to keep you from making the same distinction that he and even his minions, the angels, make. What kind of God would plant a tree of knowledge of good and evil and a tree of life, the two being synonymous, in the midst of a paradise only to tell you you cannot eat from that? What kind of paradise is that? Which does not allow measurement, evaluation, and growth. What kind of God would tell you that if you eat of that tree, you're going to die? None of these things are true, so said the serpent to Eve. And they did not die. They did gain knowledge of good and evil. The fruit apparently tasted good, because however much the trope has been persistent in Western culture, Eve did not seduce Adam into eating the apple. Because of this very backwards thought, for millennia women have been culturally treated as sneaky, counter-truthful figures and subject to horrific persecution during the witch craze, which persisted in Western and Eastern Europe for centuries. Based on this unwarranted ermith that 
Eve seduced Adam. Eve simply offered him a piece of fruit, and he ate it. And he possessed knowledge. And she was no longer just some kind of physical adjunct to him, created out of his rib, but was thinking, dynamic, choice-driven individual, which is why when feminism, anarchism, socialism, and other causes formed into a radical body politic in the early to mid 19th century, there were many reformists, artists, political rebels, and so on, including the romantics, who selected Satan as a kind of political forefather. He represented everything about change and rebelling against the status quo. So when I say that Satanism is the veneration of Satan, and I want to be very dis direct, but I'm not trying to hide that. It's vital to understand what definition and perspective I'm operating from. We have a definition of Satan from entertainment, which is ludicrous, totally stupid, and outright wrong. And we have definitions from the standard Western storyline, but we also have an esoteric insight, which I been briefly describing here, which reads a whole different story into the myth of Satan. And myths, of course, are repositories of great truth. People throughout history codified psychological insights, metaphysical insights, and insights into human nature into their myths. So I call myself a Satanist, not because I worship a creature by that name, but because I embrace the ideals that this character presents. But the ideals of not following the heavily trodden path of conformity to the norm, but taking a creative and sometimes contradictory path of discovery for ourselves. The path that leads to progress, not stagnation. The path that leads foremost to the betterment of myself with the side effect that it benefits those around me. After all, if I better myself, I can help better others. Satanism is a self-centered philosophical path, one that leads not into evil, but one that will bolster and drive us to live life to the fullest for as long as possible. This is how I view being a Satanist. It's not your normal consensus on the whole matter. Those who think that we worship an evil creature are only taking what they know about satanism from hollywood or from what they've been told in church by misinformed pastors and buy-ins of the whole storyline that satan was that serpent and was out to get us to fall but what if he was just giving us the knowledge we needed to succeed well that's about all i have time for tonight and I thank you very much for your time. Please like and subscribe and tune in every two weeks for further shows. Eventually we'll get back to doing live shows, but at the moment these recorded shows are working much better. Thank you and have a good day. Oh, Satan, who lurkest in hell, Unhallowed be thy name. Thy wasteland come, mine will be done, because earth doth be hell even now. Give us this day our cursed will, which is free, and give us the right to vengeance, as we will reciprocate pain back unto those who have earned it. Lead us not into abstinence, and deliver us from the concept of Christianity, so mote it be. Hail!